Okay. Great. Well, we're uh, we're really pleased to, um, to to have this session and this opportunity to um, talk about a conference uh, proposal that uh, we've put together for the 2021 Hope Conference, going to be titled "New Perspectives on um, the History of Women in e Economics." And so we've got a um, a few of the paper presentations here that we'll, we'll see in a moment. Um, also, a number of the um, other contributors are among the attendees day, today. So I think the way we'll run things is I'm first going to turn it over to Cleo, and Cleo will talk about sort of the aims and purposes of the conference and um, what we're hoping, uh, hoping it will achieve and the kind of work we're hoping to stimulate. Um, and then we'll, we'll have presentations from two of the contributors, uh, Mary Ann and then Camila and uh, Rebecca, and then hopefully at the end we'll have uh, a lot of time for discussion because um, I think it would be great. Uh, so obviously to get feedback on, on the paper presentation uh, the papers as they're in development, but also on the conference itself and sort of um, you know, Have a kind of meeting of the minds about um, um, You know what the conference is, is going to be about. So um, with that, I'll, I will go ahead and turn things over to Cleo um, who can uh, who can tell us more. Uh, hi, so I'm going to start sharing my screen um, just a few minutes. And I'll, I'll do my best to keep track of time, just, but yes. I, I, I don't think it's going to be a major constraint. Uh, please. Um, so for, is it working? Yes. Right. Um, so first, I'm very happy to be here, even if it's online only. Um, I just want to add that um, so before the HOPE conference, we had this session and we will also have, uh, as we learned yesterday at the business meeting, uh, a session at the ASA meeting uh, in January uh, uh, um, of uh, the coming year. So I just want to do very brief um, explanation of the title of, the, of this uh, uh, Hope, Hope Conference, uh, say a few things um, about uh, the objectives of the conference and uh, just share with you uh, uh, the, contributor, uh, um, the contributor's topic and, um, um, uh, that we have so far. Um, so first, I want to explain the new in the title um, uh, by talking a little bit about uh, the canon, the caucus and the conversation. Uh, that we want to um, uh, um, uh, renew in a sort of, um, uh, yeah. So new first refer to the, uh, to the corpus or the canon, uh, what, which is basically what is considered uh, important in the history of economics. Uh, and in that case, it it's, um, include uh, exploring new time period of the history of women in economics, new sites, um, new individual uh, that were not uh, studied before, and also new communities uh, that were not the subject of historical inquiries. Um, the second uh, new aspect, um, again, this is more uh, a wish than um, we will see after if we um, um, succeed in our objectives. Uh, so the second new aspect is about the caucus, uh, which I mean by that, who is talking? Uh, and who is contributing to the, um, the conference. Uh, for this conference, uh, for us, it was important to have uh, early career uh, scholar, uh, as well as uh, experience, uh, experience, sorry, scholars. Uh, it was also important for us to have people who had worked on gender and women in the history of economics, but also to have people who have not done work on gender, but on some other subject. Uh, and it was also important for us to have um, um, uh, sociologists, economists, uh, and, and not only historian uh, of economics. Uh, so this is a very clear strategy of mainstreaming uh, as we, uh, we want um, uh, to move uh, the, 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 the subject and the questions uh, on the status of women in the economics profession. Uh, from from the separate spaces it had been uh, kept so far uh, to uh, the center of the field uh, rather than um, just uh, acknowledge that something is done uh, at its uh, margins. Um, the third aspect of the new things we want to foster is about the conversations uh, we want to have 
uh, and that's uh, among this is the things I, I, I listed below in this slide. Uh, so first we want to produce um, new knowledge uh, uh, on the status and experience of women in the economics profession, um, on the specificity of women economist uh, ideas and practice and experiences, uh, and um, uh, producing uh, new insights on the production of knowledge uh, regarding women in the economy. And of course, we want to study the relations between those three aspects. And one of the questions we have is the weight of this different aspect um, uh, when we look at uh, specific case studies. Um, the second uh, conversation we want to have uh, is about importing uh, gender as an analytical category uh, into the study of the history of economics. What I mean by that is um, 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 to study uh, what is gendered uh, in, in the knowledge produce and what does it mean and what are the consequences of that. Uh, we also want to um, uh, discuss if uh, uh, tools uh, from um, masculinity studies are useful for us as um, uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, it's not uh, because, um, sorry, uh, even when women are absent, uh, it doesn't mean that there is no gender issues. Uh, and so there, there was, um, a gender is like a relational uh, category. It's not uh, uh, about women. Uh, and so as history of economic has been really made uh, 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 by men, uh, about men, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, things to say about uh, 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 masculinity. Uh, and so that's something we want to um, import from other fields, especially STS, but also history of science. Um, and the type of conversations uh, we actually want to have uh, is really um, basically about history uh, uh, of economics, not only history of women and economics. Uh, and it's um, really opened uh, to broader question about the status of um, the impact sorry, of uh, social economic status and identities, um, uh, the role of collaboration, uh, the way we see authorship, uh, what's the impact of prestige, credit attribution, uh, but also hierarchy um, uh, 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 within the profession, and what all those uh, different uh, historiographical objects um, how those objects impact the ideas uh, and uh, the methods uh, that economists have used um, in the past. Um, one also very important thing I didn't mention really clearly at the beginning um, about uh, what's new, it's we are specifically looking at the post-war period until um, uh, the eighties and a bit the nineties. And so we really also um, uh, enter a territory that is uh, uh, fairly uh, recent. Uh, so that was about uh, the canon, the calculus, and the conversations. Uh, I will briefly um, uh, show you the slide of the um, the contributors uh, we 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 have contacted for the, for this uh, special issues. Um, I will not um, read everything. I will just mention um, uh, that uh, the 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 name and title were like with a green background are the one who will be presented at the ASA sessions. Um, and um, I uh, think we could um, have questions on uh, the objective and uh, 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 of the conference, but also if you have specific question on some of the contributions, maybe I could share this slide again uh, uh, at a point, or we could discuss that after we have uh, the, two, uh, the two presentation. Uh, uh, that I think we will listen to right now. And uh, I'm very happy and uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Maya and Johnson and uh, Rebecca and Camilla uh, for, uh, for accepting to present uh, uh, this um, uh, today. Uh, so thanks a lot. And I will stop sharing my screen and I will mute myself. All right. I will start sharing my screen, I think. Uh, here we go. All right. Um, nice to be here today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to January session at the AEA meetings in next spring, when I hope we will be in person. Uh, 
this is uh i'm impressed by how well it's all worked but i i miss people <laughs> so there we go um all right uh as you all know right economics is a discipline is struggling with a multitude of related issues on discrimination gender and now more recently racism we have a number of groups like CSWEP that are working to understand the status of women in economics. This relates not only to women, but how the field operates, who is recognized, who isn't, and why. Traditional histories of academic women often portray them as lone voyagers. And there's a book on this, and I, I have the reference here. Um, which is kind of, it's an interesting book. Uh, it's a little bit dated, but uh, uh, it's worth a, a read, I think. Um, and in general, these studies of sort of lone women, right, take the approach of a single great woman, and they're, they're an exception to the rule. They're a special case, right? And you can take, for example, studies of Joan Robinson, right, would be a classic example. Uh, Charlotte Perkin Gilman's would be another example. Eleanor Ostrom, I would say, is not an example. Right. She actually has quite a lot to say about academic women and economists in general, um, academe in general, how it works. Uh, she recognizes that uh, the social sciences in general, right, as sort of an inherent feature, uh, really prioritize individualism over cooperation. Right? And she says, uh, historically, as a profession, right, the social sciences have rewarded individual innovation and individual accomplishments more than they have collaborative research. And I'll come back to uh, what she says about that toward the end. Um, this is pretty preliminary. I'll admit that I've had a number of false starts on this project. Ashram's written a lot of really fascinating and interesting things. And I tend to go down uh, different paths where, you know, oh, we can compare Ostrom and James Buchanan on this, or Ostrom and someone else on that. Um, and then I come back and I think about uh, the objective of the volume and uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. And it's certainly one way to write about women in economics is just to ignore that they're women, right? And we just write about ideas and the ideas that interest us. But in terms of trying to connect uh, more fully uh, with the brief or the objectives here, I realized that um, Ashton really has quite a lot to say about problems of collective decision making of kinds like uh, women or gender and economics. So my plan is to use Ashton's uh, small end case study method, and she outlines in a book. Uh, I've got a picture coming up here. Um, to study Ostrom's own community. It's a little bit meta, but uh, I think it sort of helps frame how this paper can connect to the list of the other papers uh, in terms of Ostrom's approach to multiple methods, right? And how to take a complicated question, right? attack it from many different angles, and then see what sort of generalizations or synthesis you can make. All right, uh, a little bit of background on Ostrom uh, in her academic career. Right? She talks about uh, issues of women and discrimination uh, from undergraduate to graduate to being a professor to winning the Nobel Prize. Ostrom is certainly an unusual selection to receive the Nobel Prize and work in a political science department. And I think that makes this project a little bit complicated because right, there's overlap, I'm outside, there's bugs. <laughs> um, I'm over, there's overlap with economics, but it ain't so that's a complicating feature here. Anyway, she considered herself a broad-based social scientist. Uh, she believed deeply in multiple methods. She did not like hyper-specialization. Um, she embraced complexity in theory and in practice. And she was, of course, also, right, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in the 40, first 41 years of its existence. Uh, and now, of course, there have been two. Um, unfortunately, her award preceded her death by only three years. So unlike with a lot of Nobel Prize winners, there's not a lot of time for her to generate reflection on her work, herself and her position in economics. 
So we don't get much of that, um, which is sad for sociologists and historians in the field as we try to understand right, how women create careers in economics or in the social sciences, right? What is success for them and um, how they achieve what they want to achieve. Some of this gap has been filled by her students and her colleagues and her coworkers, um, but still, uh, there's, there's things that are definitely missing. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see here that in 2010, uh, Ashton with two co-authors wrote a book called Working Together. Um, and it was reading this book as opposed to a lot of her other work that really got me thinking about Ostrom and her community and the way she worked and how the way she worked in the tact problems is really relevant to uh, thinking about the status of women in economics. So if we think about communities, right, and women's it's members of scholarly communities, uh, there's quite a few cases in history where we can see that women played an important role in knowledge production. Uh, I consider a couple of cases, the French salons of the 18th century of the Enlightenment, the interwar Bloomsbury blue stockings, right, are two cases. And if instead of studying individuals, we study groups, right, as I said, Ostrom's own research program has much to suggest. Her studies of collective decision-making regarding common pool resources and the strategies and techniques by which women build successful careers as economists are both cases where we observe a diversity of pathways of causality, a diversity of outcomes, right? And it's a situation where people have different perceptions about the quality or the desirability of the outcomes. This kind of complexity says that a single approach is not going to fully uncover the range of explanatory variables or all the possible solutions. What we need to do is rely on a multiple methods approach to draw from diverse but related fields to study complex social phenomenon. Studying common pool resources, Ostrom borrowed freely from the tools and the strategies of economics, political science, sociology, psychology, and anthropology. Doing things like small end case studies, broadly comparative field research, meta-analysis, collaborative field studies, theoretical modeling, and laboratory and field experiments. Seeking to understand what we might call the status of women in economics would benefit from similar multiple strategies, as well as the synthesis of the analysis, right? We can ask questions about things like women in the classroom and their experiences, the nature, the structure, and the functioning of the pipeline that produces economists, historical experiences of women in the field, contributions of women to the field, the quantification of women at various career stages, the quality of their experiences in economics, ontological and methodological aspects of the study of economics as they relate to the interests of women, and their experiences with mentoring and social relations in economics, quantitative and qualitative studies of discrimination of women in economics. So Ostrom suggests, right, to, if we're going to tackle such broad questions with a multitude of resources, we start by considering three different levels of analysis. Individual human behavior, the micro situation, which includes the immediate variables that impinge on individuals in a collective action dilemma, and the broader social ecological context. I wanna focus on the second one. Right, so in particular, uh, if you think about the workshop at Indiana, it's pretty clear that a lot of people have identified this as an important community, right? Um, they've had six of these so far, right? Other scholars who are related to the workshop, right, identify this as sort of a key piece of infrastructure that really allowed Ostrom to uh, be successful. Right, so the workshop was established in 1973, right, as fully the workshop in political theory and policy analysis. <coughs> as people who study institutions, right, uh, they specifically chose the name of the workshop for two reasons. One, if they chose a center, they thought that would be limiting under university rules and restrictions in terms of what centers could do, and a workshop would be a lot more flexible. And second is they want to emphasize the artesianship 
right? Or the construction and building of research. Um, and there's some very good work that's been done on this recently. Uh, Erwin Decker and Pavel Kuchar have a good paper on the Ashton workshop. Uh, Pete Becky, Stefan Kolov have also written on this. So if we study the workshop as a community, right, um, Michael Farrell defined a community as a group of peers who socialize one another into a discipline and negotiate a shared vision that guides their work. Right, this is a nice definition because it's sufficiently flexible uh, to consider both well-organized schools of thought as well as less formal groups. Looking at the literature, I add a few other pieces to this. Right? Uh, one is that it's important that scholarly communities have infrastructure. Right? So sort of ways of organizing and sharing information. Right? Journals, conferences are examples of infrastructure for fields of study. Universities have libraries, laboratories, and classrooms, which is physical infrastructure, seminars, right, centers. How infrastructure is organized uh, to foster and support intellectual life is different, right? There are informal examples. You can take Cambridge in the 1920s, right? They all go out hiking, except for Joan Robinson. Right. Uh, others have very formal systems of infrastructure, right? very structured ways of sharing and organizing information. In addition to the idea of infrastructure, there's a couple of other important features that I've identified. Uh, one is from Dina Goodman. She's a historian of the Enlightenment. She calls uh, communities, scholarly communities, a community of discourse in discourse. Right, and so it's got several levels here, right? People have to be in communication and they have to be in communication with the outside as well, right? As a way of sort of synthesizing and sorting ideas. Scholarly communities that are particularly successful are also able to achieve more as a group than they could as an individual, right? And they have a way of nurturing creativity, right? And Ostrom did this by emphasizing diversity and is interdisciplinarity. And so the question becomes, there are some communities where women are not particularly successful, right? They're definitely lone voyagers. You think about the University of Chicago, Virginia Public Choice, right? Um, where if you can name two women right, in the same place at the same time uh, working, it, it's fairly rare. And there's other communities where women are very much in evidence, right? So the Parisian salons, the women's cooperative guild movement of the Victorian era, Wisconsin institutionalism had a period where there are quite a lot of women working on very different projects. And so the question is why, right? Why are some communities better, right? At creating an environment where women can be successful than others. So, that's as far as I've gotten, really. <laughs> um, so the question becomes, right, what is it about the micro environment of some scholarly communities that allows women to be relatively more successful in leveraging their infrastructure and resources to produce knowledge and create professional careers? Right, so Ostrom in studies of collective decision-making defines important environmental variables to include the extent to which women, women, the extent to which individuals know each other. Um, so they have personal connection, the regularity of that interaction, the levels of trust among people in the community, and the mechanisms of communication. One thing that's immediately noticeable when you look at workshop documents is the degree of collaboration and cooperation evidenced in projects. Most papers, grants, and projects have multiple co-authors, and in fact, many have more than two. This is unusual, and Ostrom talks about this in her book, Working Together. She says the social sciences rarely have more than two authors. And because academic citations, right, and individual accomplishment often drive Nobel consideration, right, it's an interesting question about how Ostrom engaged in publishing so cooperatively but still managed to make her work, right, uh, individually appreciated and prevented sort of more general appropriation. 
So my plan for the rest of the paper is to adopt Ashram's small n case study methodology very overtly, right? And essentially follow the steps that she lays out, um, but apply it to the Ashram workshop. Right, so she used case studies to put the commons under a magnifying glass, she said. We can do the same for studies of women in the discipline. Right, in the case of the commons, it was the repeated small n case studies that undermined the conventional wisdom of the tragedy of the commons. Right, and that the only solutions were privatization or governmental management. Right, what she put forth was no, right, spontaneous cooperation can emerge, right, and be a very successful option. So what are we going to find in economics? Right? Conventional wisdom has speculated many of the pathways by which women are discouraged in the field. Some argue that it's the assumptions and the methods of the discipline that actively alienate women, rational beings, profit maximization, abstract modeling. And women have therefore gravitated to sociology and political science to study the interaction of people, environmental issues, and poverty. Others suggest that women are put off by teaching styles, multiple choice exams, or the lack of role models. Still others cite the inherent bias in publishing and in job offers that push women off the tenure track. Right? It is situations like this where we have a lot of complexity that Ostrom says case studies are especially useful. If we look at enough cases, we can start to see which pathways are dominant and we can start to draw generalizations and conclusions. However, it's a bit of a negative problem, right? We ask women who are successful economists, right, how they did it, but we don't ask women who are dissuaded from economics what happened and why. Right? Other questions that we can ask, why does economics lag STEM in terms of the representation of women? We would expect to see much the same, right? So what is it about, what is it that's different? We could also look at case studies of women in economics and successful Nobel Prizes in other fields. All right, but there's a problem. <laughs> Everybody's tired of the virus, right? Um, so the Ostrom archives are currently closed for the foreseeable future. I talked to the librarian a couple weeks ago. They have no set opening date. Uh, it's compounded by the fact that they had been moved out of the library anyway for renovation. Um, so right now, the, my objective is to kind of think about what sort of data Right, is available and hope that the Ostrom archives open uh, sometimes in the fall or the winter. Uh, so, so far, there's no shortage of published or written material. There's many interviews with Ostrom's and her lectures available online and are accessible. Uh, one wonderful thing is that the Ostrom Center considers digital resources sort of a collective commons and they've worked very hard to put an enormous amount of material online. Of course, there's interviews with colleagues and students, right? And then also leveraging people who have previously been in the archives or what might be in there. And so as I move forward, um, the case study and the workshop with a particular emphasis on understanding cooperation and collaboration in the workshop and how that related to Ashram's success. And I'm very open to suggestions and ideas uh, on where to go from here. Thank you. All right, that's it. Oh, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so should we turn it over now to um, Camille and Rebecca? Yes, can you hear us? I'm yes. going to share, share, okay, share a screen here. Here we go. It's working? Let me just check the time. So thank you for, for inviting us to participate in this project. We are both very excited, Rebecca and me. Um, so I am happy also that the most common citizenship within the participants of this uh, session is Colombian. I wonder why. <laughs> and so the title of our paper is Feminist Economics, Genesis and Transformation of a Subdiscipline of Economics. Mm. Let's do this. Um, feminist Economics is the redeployment of diverse research under a single academic level. 
and both the label feminist economics and the subdiscipline are relatively recent. So until the 2000s, the work of feminist economics was more frequently placed in categories as gender economics or economic methodology for general categories, in which often feminist economics do not recognize that work. So they work with them, but they do not recognize that work as belonging to those categories. For instance, the gel code feminist economics was just uh, created in 2005. The, this gel code is B54. At the beginning, they developed two strategies to institutionalize the field. On the one hand, they wanted to create an inclusive space to talk, encouraging more and diverse people to come and develop feminist economics. But simultaneously, on the other hand, they try to reinforce the border, making explicit the difference with other economics working on gender, but that were not using a feminist perspective. So they need to do both things at the same time, try to be open in order to give people very, working with different methods and different topics to come to feminist economics and at the same time make this difference with other people in the discipline of economics working on gender issues. The aim of our paper is twofold. First, we want to show the heterogeneity of the approach that coexists and is this umbrella. This is important for us. Feminist economics is an umbrella. And the porosity of the groups that coexist within this umbrella. And second, um, to offer a global picture. Because yes, it's heterogeneous, yes, there is some porosity within them, but we want also to show what happened in a more global level. Mm. And for so doing, we are going to elaborate, we are, are going to show this um, global picture through five different tensions. The first one is the relation between CISWEB and IAFI. The second one is um, a methodological reflection opposing many strain methodology with feminist economics methodology. The third one is uh, between uh, uh, feminist economics and the rest of economics. This feminist economics within economics or outside economics. And this we are going to do it from the point of view of feminist economics, but also from the point of view of economics. And also we want to develop this tension between the different topics that feminist economics are currently working on. And our fifth tension is um, between the internationalization of the um, association and all the institutions that are associated to feminist economics, and also the fact that there is also a very US-centered um, conception and organization of the subdiscipline. We are going to, we are working with five different types of sources. First, we are working on the trajectory of 28 women, the, uh, the past uh, 24 presidents of IAFI, the International Association for Feminist Economics, plus four key figures during the um, constitution of this subdiscipline. Sub Second, we are also making an extensive list of the publication of this group of 28 women in order to see how they were um, related with the rest of the discipline of economics. A uh, third um, source is um, what we call milestones. These are landmark books that are either collective, collective works that put together the work of different feminist economists or that are individual pieces of work that, were, that influence the work of other uh, women and men doing feminist economics. We also finish um, 12 semi-structured uh, interviews and we have three more scheduled that we are going to uh, conduct soon in the forthcoming weeks. And we are using the minutes of IAFI Executive Committee meetings as part of our sources, and we are doing archival work with those um, documents. So let's just start with the tensions. First tension, the relationship between CISWEB and IAFI. But before developing this uh, tension, it's important to make some introduction in general. So there is many precursors of feminist economist movement before the label 
This process happened during the 1970s and 80s. Something very important during these years is Seth Bosher publication. Then we have in 1971, this movement within the discipline of economics um, and the um, demands for more uh, opportunities for women within the profession that um, was make more concrete during 1972 with the creation of the Committee on the Status of Women in the Economic Profession, CISWEP. We have here um, three colleagues that are working in the history of CISWEP, and they have shown us that the birth of CISWEP was tied to a large social concerns related with feminism, civil rights movement, the growth of public awareness on, of, on issues surrendering the discrimination and inequality. And also something that is important to highlight here is the success, the relative success in raising the representation of women within the economic profession. And this emphasis on raising the representation of women in the, in the economic profession is something that differentiates feminist economies from the women that were working in, the, um, in this world. The focus on raising um, the representation of women in the economic profession could be opposed to a more ambitious and, in a way, revolutionary goal of um, making how we think in economics different and to create also a more ambitious institutional change in the, um, in the profession. And something here that we can see is this is split between the two movements during the 90s. This web continue working to make um, market economics uh, allow fem women to develop careers in economics, but at the same time, and this is when feminist economics uh, enter in the scene to incorporate a multidisciplinary to incorporate multidisciplinary methods into economics for feminist ends. So we have in one, the one hand the multidisciplinarity in terms of methods, and also the end as being feminist. Two important moments we have, we have here. The first one is the creation of IAFI, the International Association for Feminist Economics in 1992, and then the creation of the Journal uh, of Feminist Economics in 1994. And so we want to share with you some of the quotations that we are um, selecting from our interviews. And here we want to quotate Myra Strover. She is the third president of IAFI. And she told us this. Starting IAFI was a brave move because it was becoming clear that our original hopes that this web will be a radical organization was just not happening. I was on the original committee of this web and we had very high hopes at the time that we could make major changes. But the problem with this web is that it was a committee of the American Economic Association. And so we really couldn't do anything except with the association blessing. And this is center. So also feminist economists want to do things on their own without needing the blessing of the American Economic Association. Um, here we have a list of the main institutional moments that were important in the creation of um, this new subdiscipline, feminist economics. The first thing is something that happened in a meeting of SSAA in 1990, where Diana Strassman organized a panel called Can Feminists Find Home in Economics? During this um, panel, Jane Shackelford and April Ernie invite the members that were participating in this panel to sign up and start a network. Three years later, in 1992, this network was transformed in the, inter in the International Association for Feminist Economics. It's important this for, it was also, it shows it, it makes explicit that it was a goal for feminist economics. In 1983, we have an important moment that shows um, this international um, dimension of the association. In 1983, Edith Keeper organized a conference in Am Amsterdam that was called Out of the Margin, Feminist Perspective on Economic Theory. And this was the first moment of the creation of what afterwards was called the European chapter. And now they also have chapters in other parts of the world, like in Australia, in New Zealand, and in Latin America. And in 1994, as I just said, the creation of Feminist Economic Journal. 
Um, so what happened between Sysweb and AIAP? And we are gonna um, make um, explicit how we are trying to discuss from now with other papers that are making part of this special issue. So as the most contentious aspect of women's research on gender related issues move out of CISWEB, so move out from CISWEB, and most of them went to IAPI, what remained had by the early 90s become more mainstream and more moderate, as well as less central, less central in the context of the discussions that were taking place within the economic profession. Feminist comments follow a separate path, and this is the path that we are going to study and that are, we are going to present right now. Uh, so the second tension is um, feminist economic methodologies against the mainstream. At the beginning, the main common point among the feminist economics was a critique of mainstream economic theory the methodology and also the policy recommendation. The critique begin in microeconomics and, and microeconomics of the household in particular and labor market and separate to and spread later to macroeconomics, international trade and ultimately extending to all areas of traditional economic analysis. So one that is key to understand a uh, feminist economics methodology is Julie Nelson and she has um, developed most of the basis of what feminist economists uh, use as part of their methodological and epistemological reflection. So in this critique, while feminist economic dissatisfaction with mainstream economic scholarship was originally rooted in neglected and the distortion of women experience in economics, but the late 80s feminist economists were also raising a more um, complete and global critique of feminist economics, of economics in general. Many feminist economists were finding that traditional formal choice theory modeling uh, was too narrow and they was also too arbitrary. And this is something that is important, the fact that it was arbitrary. And they um, find that uh, something that made this arbitrary explicit is that they were important things that economists have to study that were happening outside the market and that we need to study also those activities in order to have a more um, appropriate version of what was happening at the, in the economy. Um, the contribution also argue that um, some values that we associate with being scientific and with rigor are associated with uh, characteristics that have like a masculine bias and this bias makes economics less objective because we are telling a story just from one point of view. And what they were doing was to go in a higher level and try to see, to show a bigger picture that was also more objective in that sense. Um, while these kind of critiques are still important in uh, feminist economy, Today, there is less and less women and men feminist economists that are working in this kind of topic. So we just uh, seen uh, the first tension uh, between uh, CISWEB and Feminist Economics uh, Association, and then the main criticism to the methods of mainstream economics. And the third tension that we observe during the interviews in particular is when we ask them so how do you, do you place your work? How do you consider, consider yourself? Do you want to be considered uh, as an economist and you want to stay in economics department and to be cool and to be uh, still around and rounded uh, about, um, with uh, economists? And they all say yes, but with a deep criticism. So they say uh, feminist studies, feminist economics, these uh, they agree that they want to be to remain within economics. Most of these feminist economics do applied oriented work. So we think that the applied turn that happens in economics, this turns open new opportunities uh, for feminist economics. And this was shown by a colleague, feminist economist, uh, Tehani in, in a recent article. And also that the recent visibility of gender issues that we all can uh, 
have the evidence in the in the current debate has reinforced the place of feminist economics within economics. But for us, was very uh, was very surprised that they all answer yes. We want to stay uh, in uh, economics. And we have some quotations uh, from the interviews. Uh, so this is also from Myra Strober. She said, Diana Strassman asked Robert Solo to be a discussion of this first asset section. And he was very supporting of having more women in economics. And basically what he said was, economic is a good field. We are happy to welcome women, but we have a good game going here. And women are welcome to join the game, but we are not going to change the game in order to have women in the profession. So you can come, you, you are welcome, but you are not allowed to change. You are annoyed to criticize economics. So they stay. Was difficult, difficult to find tenure, difficult to dialogue and to obtain grants, and difficult to uh, uh, continue supporting other PhD students. And they well, co they are completely aware of this um, of these problems. So uh, tension four. Uh, what uh, all of these uh, different approaches in, in economics that they have. Uh, then they found um, uh, they can found under the same label uh, feminist economics. What we observe is that there there uh, there are a lot of collective publications. What we decide to call the milestone, we found at least fifteen milestones for fem who, which def define what is feminist economics. So this milestone. And we, in, in each of the interview, we asked them, uh, they did this milestone to assemble their work, to gain on visibility, to delimit these uh, boundaries that uh, Camila was talking about, the perimeter of the subdiscipline, and to also to create a coherence among all of different topics that they work on. So we have this um, basic, uh, like the foundation, the publication that really founded the subdiscipline. We have the very known uh, book, Beyond Economic Men, published by uh, Marianne Ferber and Julie Nelson. Then we have Barbara Berman, Joyce Jacobson, Nancy Fulber, Eddie Keeper, Julie Nelson, Jane Humphreys, Robin Barclay. And we started having, in the early 2000, collective works. And very impressive, like three volumes, four volumes, like uh, 800 pages uh, books. This is exactly, you know, and on topics like uh, feminist economics critical concepts, uh, feminist economics uh, counting on. So this was uh, an homage to Marilyn Warren, a new advance in feminist economics. So all of this, when we like go and see who are the authors, there is a link between the authors of this milestone and the uh, woman that became the president of the society. So we, we build these tables about this uh, topics, these trajectories, and we saw that they work on very different uh, subjects, feminist pedagogy, social policies, economic history, labor economies. Uh, uh, so from the first president, uh, Jean Shackleford, until the very last one, uh, we have all of these uh, different um, themes of work, research topics. Uh, on, and so we see like a diversity and we are considered that maybe this is one of the solutions that they uh, found to stay, uh, uh, talking about the tension tree, with, within the economics. Last tension, the tension between the internationalization, the openness, so we want to uh, conquer the world and establish uh, the society, the journal, and the subfield, the subdiscipline feminist economics around the world, or we want a more uh, U.S. center, uh, small group, or more, we stay in the United States. So from the very beginning, they, uh, Jean Shackleford that we interviewed interview recently, and from also the last one, uh, President, they always have this aim, and we saw, uh, uh, even if when we start to do the ac academic affiliation, we saw that among the 24 IFP president, 11, uh, presidents are from USS, one born in Spain, Lourdes Veneria, and the others are, well, four from UK. So it's true that when we uh, look for the presidents, most of them are from United States. 
And, you know, Myra Strober told us um, during the interview, we found that uh, we need an international organization. And this was a main difference with uh, CISWEB. CISWEB was an American organization. And we felt very strongly that we needed an international organization for feminist economy because the change we wanted to make were not just about the US, they were worldwide. So they were very ambitious and they still very ambitious in terms uh, of this international uh, uh, change that they want. When we look like the conference from the first one in the 1992 until the last one that they want to organize this year in Ecuador, we saw that uh, for the, this 29 past conference, only nine times the conference was in the United States, nine times in Europe, Canada, Australia, China, in Africa, in Turkey, and four in Latin America and the Caribbean. So here we see uh, an effort to uh, make this internationalization of the subfield uh, and also, of course, the society and the journal. Preliminary conclusions, and, and we'd like to take a little bit of time to discuss with you about this. So we want to tell this story through the five tensions that we see. So it's like five questions that were in the interviews, in the archives, in, uh, in the trajectories, in the shoes of the presidents we, we observe. The first one is between the, the CISWEP and the IAP. So the Committee for the Women in Economic Profession and the International Association for Feminist Economy. Most of the founding members, and they told us, they met during the CISWEP uh, meetings, because this was before, this was at the late 70s, early 80s, so they met there. And the two groups start to evolve separately because really the aim, their aim were different. So today, some of the IAP presidents and uh, the four or uh, of, uh, the other uh, that we are interviewing, so Diana Strasma, Julie Nelson, Diana Elson, and Carmen Diana Dari, they say, many of them say, we want to work more together, but some other prefer to keep the group uh, separate. The second uh, question is, do we continue to fight against uh, you know, to mainstream economics in particular, elaborating a methodology that uh, critiques like the structure of economics? Well, uh, at least if we see uh, the Journal of uh, Feminist Economics and we see the programs of the, of the conference, we observe that less feminist economists are currently working on epistemology, on methodology, and this was a central part of the research programs in the 90s, okay? They still all very critique, and this is the main critique, uh, the method of mainstream economics, the market, the vision of economics, but there are less feminist economists working on this stuff. The third question is, do we stay uh, inside or do we go out? Uh, and this for us was really a surprise, so they decide uh, to stay, even if it's uh, and it's still uh, hard. And the way that we found uh, that they, you know, uh, uh, still, uh, still working on economics department is through a pluralistic um, way of work, interdisciplinary groups, and also, and this is attention for doing different and working on different topics. So this is a diverse uh, on topics and, and research uh, themes, microeconomics, macro agriculture, economics, economics history. And also we think that these topics, so even if today when we see the review, the, the journal, we see a lot of care on pay work, household uh, bargaining, gender budgeting, these topics will certainly evolve following their field work and the context and the current debates, because they really work, feminist economics, they really works on, you know, on the field work and on the, you know, current debate. About the, the, the question of uh, internationalization or more US centered, they uh, really want to have an international society, an international journal. They do a lot of deliberate actions that they apply to grants to finance and to do mentorship programs, to do translation, to support. 
And, but this still is really a challenge because there are a lot of criticism from many people from the South that don't feel represented in the society and in the journal. So the more general uh, conclusion, and we are almost finishing. The label feminist economics finally is relatively new. So we saw that the, it, the jail code exists from 2005, and the society is relatively new and the journal too from the 90s. And all of this organization and diverse uh, research is under the same level, feminist economics. Feminist economics uh, topics are part of the current debates. Uh, and what is happening, and uh, the last president told, uh, talk about this in the last uh, SSA meeting in January, they are appropriating feminist economics ideas and approach, but without quoting their name, that are still relatively unknown, uh, economics, uh, for the economists outside of the discipline. And as you know, visibility is important to increase the decision making, uh, participation, and in particular, the power of women and minorities and the society. Last slides. So uh, we think that these are the main uh, stages, uh, steps, uh, facts. The 1919 panel at the ASSA meeting, the creation of the associ association in 1992, the journal is fundamental for this story, and the 29 uh, international conference. And for us, uh, the milestones are very important. And we think that uh, what feminist economists be until from the beginning until now so the creation of the society the creation of the journal the session that they organize every january as we also uh, used to do good the mentorship program all of these um, contribute to make things easier for the new generation so thank you very much and we were happy to answer all your questions Thank you, Camila and Rebecca, and uh, thank you, of course, also to, to Marianne. Um, yeah, so I think we've got um, plenty of time to um, you know, have a discussion, um, about obviously, about both papers, but also about the, the conference in, in general. And it seems like, um, you know, the, the Q&A is already uh, uh, queuing up a little bit uh, little, with questions. I, I, don't, I think each, each person should be able to click on that and see some of the questions coming back and forth. So I, I think I'll just kind of get things started by um, bringing to the fore some of these questions. And then um, uh, I know Marianne, you've already been uh, kind of going back and forth here, but um, you know, kind of have, uh, bring them into the discussion, uh, I guess is what I'm saying. So um, just, to, just to get things started in that sense. So um, Jimena in the, in the Q&A was asking, um, uh, regarding Marianne's work on, on Lynn Ostrom, um, sort of about the personal environmental conditions that allowed uh, Lynn specifically to become a leader of this kind of workshop and, and sort of movement. Um, you know, it was now we now use the term the Bloomington School um, to some degree. And uh, and then the, I think it was a set of follow up questions um, related to sort of the connection to economics in, in Lynn's own work. Um, so I, I turn it over to you, Marianne, um, and then we'll just kind of draw from the Q and A questions. Um, going forward. There we go. Uh, those are really excellent questions. Um, that's probably the biggest thing I'm struggling with is how to relate Ostrom and her work to economics specifically, uh, because she actively claimed she was a social scientist, a broad-based social scientist, and didn't want to be pigeonholed. So, as the research moves forward, I think this is one of the big questions is sort of where and how she intersects with economics. And I plan to start by looking at the public choice uh, literature in particular, because I think she and Vincent Ostrom were at the founding of the Public Choice Society. So we can kind of look at publications in public choice and participation in the conference and how much overlap between public choice and the workshop there was and to uh, attempt some similar strategies, uh, maybe at the AEA meetings or other places to look for where there's direct interaction. Um, but a lot of this research still has to be done. I, I admit um, I've only started to dig and I don't really know exactly what direction or what the answers are gonna be yet, but it's really fascinating. Uh, she is a very interesting person and 
not very easy to put in a box of any kind. So uh, I think my biggest concern is to keep the project manageable. And so we will see what winds up in the project and what winds up out of the project as it evolves. Um, okay. Yeah. Just to take take the liberty as the as the chair as a follow up question, I I guess one worry I've always had when we you know we talk about the Ostroms is that that sort of ambigu you know creates an ambiguity between the two right um, and in, in some ways I wonder if that um, creates you know, more uh, you know in some way discredits you know Eleanor's distinct contributions. Um, you know, talking about the Bloomington School or the Ostroms uh, as a as a collective right. unit, as opposed to, you know, if you know if she kept her her maiden name, right, it would be Eleanor Awan and uh, Vincent Ostrom, as opposed to the Ostroms. And so, um, I guess, sort of thinking about her personal trajectory, you know, uh, I was thinking, wondering how you're kind of thinking about these issues as well. Yeah, that's a really good question because she really conflates the two of them. Um, Right, in her personal reminiscences and what she talks about, you know, they're a team, but he doesn't win the Nobel Prize and he's not named. Right. <laughs> uh, and it's not like it was a solo Nobel Prize. Oliver Williamson was also named that year. So yeah. trying to separate that out is going to be interesting. Um, well, they work collaboratively a lot, they didn't really co author all that many papers. Right. right. So maybe the, the path is to sort of, you know, create a trajectory of each of their research and sort of see um, who it influenced uh, is sort of a way to start to separate them. But uh, it's, it's, uh, I'd love to know what the Nobel Prize Committee was thinking. Um, yeah, they didn't want to name. I guess we probably will never know, will we? <laughs> they didn't want to give two political scientists an econ Nobel, I guess. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I think we I think we have a number of questions here um, queued up for uh, Camila and Rebecca too. So and then as as maybe more questions coming from Marianne or about the conference, we'll pick those up. So um, Beatrice Sherry is, is you know wondering about sort of the generalness of this the strategy of. Um, the, the facing feminist e econo economists, um, but you know, it, but its general application to I think groups in general of, at the same time, you know, creating inclusivity and, and drawing boundaries, and, and so she's asking, you know, is this this is sort of seems like a very um, broad tension, and so I guess the question is sort of you know the, the specific ways it plays out amongst uh, feminist economics economists. Give you guys a chance to respond. Yeah. Thank you, Beatrice, for the question. So the first one is related with the fact that this tension between being sufficiently broad and at the same time creating these borders, you ask us if this is something that is general to all communities. I think that's true. What makes feminist economics a little different from other groups is that they insist in this side of making of using feminist economies as an umbrella term that includes different kinds of methods, different kinds also of political orientations, different kinds of topics of research. So maybe I, I do agree, we do agree with the fact that both are um, challenges that communities have to address while they are creating unity and at the same time differentiating. And I think the particular thing about feminist economies is the fact that they insist more in the fact of having a very broad umbrella. And then um, you mentioned a tension between these boundaries and keeping the outsiders out, out and at the same time uh, having this epistemological commitment. And this is something that is very important and related with the internationalization of the association because they want to include more people coming from different countries. And usually these people are trained with very traditional methods. So they, there is a trade-off that is important and that is creating tensions within the association between having more people coming from different places working in gender related issues but that are less committed 
with this epistemological critique and at the same time keeping people doing gender work with a not feminist um, intention or not having feminism as the center of the research outside. So this tension of um, borders and epistemological commitment, it's also um, at the middle of other tension that is between having a US center movement and having an international uh, movement. You want to say? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I want to say thank you, thank you, Beatrice, and and the others that because we are looking at little bit the other question. I would love to see you and to and to be in front of you and and answer and continue all these uh, answering all these questions. The third question that Beatrice asked is what boundary uh, did they choose, especially toward uh, toward mainstream, and also when we talk about a wider range of methodological perspectives. Uh, perspective what we are thinking about and so uh, the boundary change uh, depends on what feminist economics we are interviewing or we are discussing with because they are really more uh, strict with the boundaries because their methodological particular methodological approach in particular Julie Nelson, Nancy Fulbright uh, and of course well, because we are very lu very lucky uh, among the 24 presidents 22 still alive. So we can do the, the interviews to 22 and these four more. So I think the common boundary uh, with Camila that we found in the interviews is feminism. They say there is something that no one of our colleagues, uh, mainstream economics, uh, share with us when we discuss about this is the feminism. They are not feminists. Uh, and about the wider, wider range of methodological, methodological perspectives, uh, this they insist a lot because, for example, Lourdes Veneria, when we interviewed her, she said, I am a Marxist and I'm still a Marxist. But my, my colleagues and friends from uh, IAFI are um, institutional economics, are more, you know, uh, um, apply uh, econometrician. And, and they are doing reviews of all these articles. And I think the key for this wider range of methodological, methodological perspective is Diana Strassman, because her vision for the journal is very open uh, in, in particular to method. Sorry to be so long, because there are many questions. And I think a follow-up question um, comes comes from Raphael, which I think gets at some of the issues that you're uh, you're, you're bringing up here. Um, and also, I'll just I'll just quote from his question. You know, thinking specifically about Robin's definition of you know economics as, you know, ends and means and being value free, I can see he says I see a lot of econ economics might resist feminist economics due to its value laden nature, or at least in their view, its value laden nature. Um, and, and, and you know at that that sort of emerges as a strategy for making feminist you know, economics essentially heterodox. Um, so I think the question here is um, supposes that and therefore open to anyone in theory because it uses a neutral method. And is that sort of a, a an analysis that you guys agree with, or do you see that? How do you see this as playing out in the story of feminist economics? So we were listening in the. Yeah, I think that was yesterday, uh, the presentation that the current president of IAFI made during the last ASSA meeting in San Diego. And she made this list about what feminist economics share, some elements that all of them agree on. And this is a very broad list, but one of the elements that she put on the list, and we, we were during that, that session at the door, like a common agreement on that point, is that all the... The, when we choose a subject, when we choose tool, tools or methods to study that subject, those are judgments and there are values that are included there. So this idea of objectivity as being value-free is something that feminist economists do not share and they do did that from the beginning. I think this is something that is still very um, appropriate to say, even though they are being let's say more flexible in terms of methods and discussing more with the mainstream, but they still agree in the fact that those are the process of choosing methods and tools 
it's something that is not value free. Great. Um, so I'm going to switch over. There's a question from Emily Scarbeck in the um, webinar chat for, for Marianne. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of just jump back and forth as things come in. So she says, in thinking about Ostrom's relationship with economics, it's important to distinguish the, the fields. Ostrom's work is closest to, to two areas outside of the mainstream, institutional economics and public choice. She says, I think there's some, also something to be said of the type of work Ostrom was doing lends itself to collaboration in important ways that work of theory in work in theory or econometrics um, does not. Um, for instance, rich case studies require people who have deep knowledge of, of institutional details. I, I agree with that entirely. Um, Ostrom writes uh, in somewhere. Um, about how, well, you could just, if you can do your work in a carol in the library, well, that's all fine. Um, then you don't need a workshop uh, and a lot of people, right? Um, but if you really wanna ask complex questions about the real world, uh, you basically need some colleagues and collaborators uh, to tackle problems. And I think that's a really interesting aspect of how she works because, um, it's very easy for me to compare her to Buchanan, but Buchanan is very much, you know, I overcame my background and my Southern roots and it's all me and here I am. And um, very different sort of attitude toward the same sort of collective problems. So um, just interesting, uh, an interesting aspect of Ashton. And I look forward to reading even more about it. Great. So one question from, from Maxine for, for Camila and Rebecca um, concerns their, how, how feminist economics relates to the, the, the use of the word heterodox specifically. So yes, was there evolution of the use of the label heterodox within the feminist economics community? Um, obviously there's these, these tensions, um, but was the concept of heterodox an important part of the identity um, or, and probably how has that evolved um, for the members of IAFI? That's the label. Also raising your hand, so we'll let her chime in on this as well. It just, it's exactly linked to that because it's the um, how you use labeling or self-identification to trace boundaries, uh, boundary making, boundary work. And so I think it's the maxim question on the heterodox as also a sort of like symmetric things about uh, conservatism, conservative feminism. So that's a label used by Posner. And so, yeah, how, how, is there any conservative feminists who call themselves like this and we're part of IFA and, or is it something that doesn't really uh, exist? So thank you, Maxima and, and Cleo. What we are trying to do with labels, in particular with the heterodox label, is to mm, first try to understand self-identification but take it just as that, as self-identification and confront that self-identification with other, what others were saying and the labels that others were using. In the interviews, we noticed something is that they do not use the label heterodox to define feminist economy. They um, prefer to say that they have a broad and this umbrella term that includes different approaches but the heterodox term is used more from the outside to put them and to minimize in a certain way their work and their contribution at something that is outside the um, mainstream of economics. Something else that we notice is that they, um, there is a trade-off between taking um, credit for some of what of the, um, I don't know, the contributions in terms of one important is um, understanding the household not, uh, not as a unit, but something that is composed of different individuals and what we do inside the household can have consequences outside the household. That's something, that's a contribution that they, uh, feminist economists think that make, that came from what they have been doing. And the mainstream incorporate those ideas re, um, in a process. So even though they were the ones who started, these ideas migrate 
to the mainstream. And so the labels also change in that process. And you want to say something else? Yes, about? I want to add the, uh, yeah, thank you, Maxime and Cleo for the question. I want to add that, um, uh, again, this is something that is different uh, uh, from the founders of the society uh, to the current um, participants to the conference, uh, authors that publish in, in the journal. Uh, so there is a debate, big debate. Uh, there are many feminist economists, in particular the founders, that consider that the journal now is becoming a very orthodox. So they use the word orthodox when they talk about the journal. Uh, because they say, ah, there are just a little, when I, when we ask, why you say that this is orthodox and this is, it's only apply economics and feminism is disappearing. So they, these are the two uh, features. For, you know, according to the founders, it means this is the very um, strong criticism to, to the mainstream economics. But the position of the editor and the new co-editor of the journal is really, you know, uh, more more open and in, in relation to these categories heterodox and uh, what is heterodox and orthodox so when the gel code uh, was uh, you know established for them in 2005 was already in a, a part of the heterodox but there are other um when we observe like the gel code that they uh, put themselves for the articles they use a lot of other jail codes not only feminist economy so, you know, this is also very important for us. It's like themselves, they, they don't only consider, like they don't only put the gel code, feminist economics, so the heterodox gel code. They, they put a lot of gel codes, in particular, uh, labor markets or care or other, you know, that are not particular heterodox. And I, I want to add something on this the idea of conservative feminism. And this week we were listening, we were working on Lourdes Benaria's interview and she identifies herself as a Marxist. And when she was talking about the work of other feminist economists, she sometimes the first word that came to her mind was conservative feminists. And then immediately she corrected herself and said, no, liberals. So there is this duality between conservative and liberal. The first one, the one that came like intuitively was conservative. And the second one, when she talked a little more hard about that and that she self-censored herself in a sense, was liberal. Yeah. Liberal in the sense classical liberal? Or in the sense uh, I'm not sure, I think more, yeah, I think more in that sense. Because it's definitely how, yeah. yeah. Thanks. And question for Camila and Rebecca from, from Jessica Rodriguez Colon. Um, she, she says, I noticed you included Cooper and Baker's Toward a Feminist Economics philosophy within your tension for, to what extent are you considering philosophy of economics and their limited inclusion of women's perspectives and their historical contributions? Also, besides Cooper and Baker, what philosophers of economics, if any, are you including in your research? She wonders if these ideas could inform themes like fem or terms like feminists within feminist economics and beyond in a dialectical way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for this question, because this is also something that we thought that we will find more uh, when we started to do this research uh, one year ago. We thought that uh, feminist economics will be more charged uh, with uh, a dimension and a reflection about philosophy of economics and, you know, and, and really feminism. And every time we ask, like, what kind of uh, feminism do you, uh, uh, is your feminism, they are a little bit embarrassed. Uh, so they don't really answer to us. And for, for us, this, this is very surprising because they say that this is the key element in common. And at the same time, they also have a different, uh, um, definitions and positions on feminism. So we include uh, Eddie Keeper uh, and, and Drusella, um, Drusella Baker. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we don't have, because this milestone is also when we ask them, what are the texts that you use to do your courses on feminism economics? What are the, the books that have more reviews when they, when they were published? And unfortunately, there are not too many. So there, there is this, uh, 
I think we can consider also the first uh, works uh, by Julie Nelson, uh, among, because there is a reflection on, on philosophy of, of feminist economics, but uh, they are all complaining, these founders, about the lack of fem philosophy of feminist economics in the current uh, conference and in the current articles published in the journal. So we have to do it. <laughs> there are a less history, less epistemology, and less philosophy of feminist economics. So I think we have some more time left. Um, I, I may, maybe I missed some questions in, in the queue. So if, if I did, um, please, please submit, um, and so so we can we can keep the discussions continued. Um, thinking about um, a, you know, a, I think you know, Marianne. The, the, so this question about credit. I think is sort of a, the recurring theme. I think that uh, and draws a lot of interest with respect to uh, Eleanor, Eleanor, and and Vincent. Um, and I, I guess what strikes me with your sort of your small biographical summary of her career and what limited stuff I've known about it from, from some of the work I did on Charles Tebow is early on her career tracks sort of like this this stereotypical women's economist career, right? She. She marries a um, sort of her advisor. Uh, she she's sort of the the trailing spouse in uh, in his 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 hire as a full professor, but then you know fast forward forty years and you know she's the one win, winning the Nobel Prize and so this seems like a an an interesting story an interesting case study uh, as as you put it uh, in part for the for these dimensions of it um, so yeah turn, curious about your thoughts on this. Oh, and Cleo, Cleo maybe wants to add something here. Okay, afterwards. Um, I don't have a lot of thoughts yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's definitely a work in progress. Uh, and I really appreciate all the comments and suggestions along this line. Um, I've been kind of putting off looking at it because Ostrom has more than 400 published works. <laughs> And it's a little daunted to start, uh, but it's a good place for uh, the rest of the summer. And so I hope that when we all come back together in January, uh, maybe I'll have some more commentary for you. Uh, but um, we will maybe uh, Cleo and I think Rebecca both had some things that they wanted to talk about before the end here. I Go ahead, Cleo. Yeah, I just want to add that I, I copy the questions and so I will be, because there is a lot of sort in them, and so I will be sharing this with the participants of the session. Uh, and, um, and of course, uh, uh, this is an ongoing conversation that could also uh, continue on Twitter. Uh, uh, I will do a short uh, um, report on this session on Twitter uh, for some of you. And of course, uh, if anyone is interested in the, the project itself, uh, write to me. Uh, send me your thoughts. Um, 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 well, yeah, send uh, send us your your thought. Yeah, and uh, Re Rebecca, you wanted. To... Yeah. Well, they they have other questions in the in the Q and A. Uh, Janomenica, Jimena, and others. Uh, we will answer you. We will send emails, and we we continue the conversation. But uh, what I want to say before uh, we leave, because I see many people connect, and thanks again to be here on Saturday afternoon online, um, is that we will send uh, very soon a message uh, through the show list um, to reactivate our uh, diversity caucus. Uh, so um, during uh, the HES conference two years ago, we create a, a group of discussion, very open, uh, open to everybody uh, that wants to discuss about women uh, or other uh, minorities. And in particular, uh, today, because of the situation, uh, we really want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, listen uh, uh, different voices, different opinions. Uh, so I think I will send a message uh, to organize a Zoom, uh, but with all the cameras on, then we, ca uh, we can see each other. And then maybe we can, you know, uh, uh, create a group of discussion. I don't want to particularly be the leader of this group. I would love to have new people 
coming to this diversity caucus. So it's nothing to do in particular with the HES executive. Uh, it's an independent group open to discussion. We can uh, go and uh, ask uh, the, the executive, uh, HES executive meeting if we need something, if we want to suggest something, but it's an independent group. So only to tell you that you will receive a message through the show list and I would love to have many answers and to discuss with you uh, in a Zoom conversation. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's great. So we've got a, a few minutes left. Uh, I noticed, or Cleo noticed that I missed one question in particular. So, uh, th and this is for Camila and Rebecca and uh, we can go ahead and end it up on, on this. So a question from Jimena Hurtado is specifically about geography and, and, and location and in, in, in its intersection here. So she writes that maybe because economics in Latin America is much more policy driven, and you guys raised you know, the observation about Colombia, as opposed to pure research or academic oriented, um, is, is that created a difficulty in establishing links and conversations with feminist econom economists outside the U.S.? Um, she mentions Carmen Diana Deer, who worked for a long time in and on Colombia, and Magdalena Leon, a sociologist and other feminists, but these were not really linked to academia, except for at the Escuela de Genero at uh, Universidad Nacional. So this is a very interesting question and uh, re I remember the first article that Camila and I we wrote together about the woman that work at the CEPAL, at the Economic Commission for Latin America. And we observed uh, things in common with the feminist economists. They have a group of women work on poverty, work on uh, care, work uh, on, as Jimena said, uh, yeah, topics that touch women, family, kids. Um, and it's true that in the case of uh, CEPAL, because uh, was many of the studies for in Latin America was policy driven. So it's true that there is a link between feminist economics, uh, policy driven um, uh, topics and uh, women, family and kids. And what is also, uh, what also makes the link between this first article, um, about the CEPAL and feminist economics is that these economists, these feminist economists, as Carmen Diana Derry that you quote, works with some colleague sociologists. So they are in between the two, or you know, they are doing a lot of field work. So they work together uh, and they don't see any problem. But at the end, they they have the journal, they have the, the um, association, so they can go easily from this not academic world that they are doing in Latin America, student poverty or other stuff, to uh, you know, the articles that they also need to progress in their career. So they all explain us, us the importance of, of the society, of the journal, even if they still working on the topics that they love and with the colleague, sociologists, colleagues that they like to work with. So this is, in this way, the institutions were so important for feminist economics, the society and the journal. Yeah. And just something very short. IAFI is, have a special status as an organization that makes part of the United Nations. So the link with the policy making is also very institutional. It's also, it also works on an institutional level. And when we are, doing the trajectories of all the presidents of IAFI. We make the list of their affiliation, both academic and outside academia, and most of them have also associations with international organizations where the policy making is more or less important than in academia. Interesting, great. Well, I think we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists, Marianne, Camila, Rebecca, also so Cleo for a uh, fine introduction up to the conference. And we also need to thank Amy, uh, who did excellent organizational work uh, putting all this together. Uh, just fantastic. We wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have successfully, uh, this would not be a success without her. So um, absolutely thank you to Amy as well. Uh, and, and thank you to all, all the participants. Um, you know, obviously, you know, papers and projects, this is a collaborative process. And so all of this benefits from, from feedback and discussion. And so, uh, you know, we're really grateful, uh, grateful for the comments and questions and hope uh, this will sort of be the initiation of a, of a larger discussion 
not just about the conference next year, but you know about this the set of topics and the set of issues um, in, in the history of economics field in general. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, hope Thank you all you. have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks a lot. Thank you, John. Good to see you guys. Take care. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cleo.